Hello and welcome to this IIEA webinar with Dr. Lawrence H. Summers. At such an extraordinary time in both human and economic affairs, it is a really great pleasure to welcome someone who's standing among the world's economists and economic policymakers is quite simply unsurpassed. Apart from being one of the most listened to analysts of economic affairs in his current role as Charles W. Elliott, a professor at Harvard, Larry has served as US Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration, head of the National Economic Council during the Obama administration, chief economist of the World Bank and president of Harvard University, among others. This afternoon, Larry will share his perspectives on the American and world economies at a time of unprecedented policy experimentation in response to the pandemic. Before we, we begin, let me note that the IIEA is currently celebrating its 30th anniversary with distinguished guests such as Larry joining us. Over the next week or so, we'll be hosting the Taoiseach, Ireland's Foreign Minister, the President of the Eurogroup, and the Chief Economist of the European Central Bank, among others. You can check out the details on IIEA.com. Back to today's session, it will be all on the record, both the opening remarks and the Q&A. You can get involved in that Q&A using Zoom's de dedicated function, which you should see at the bottom of your screens. Larry, thanks again so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dan. I have very fond memories of my visit to Dublin to speak to your group a uh, decade ago. I only wish that I had the opportunity to be returning in person rather than returning uh, virtual, rather than returning virtually. I'm grateful for that kind introduction. It, reminded me of how our President Johnson used to respond when he was introduced uh, very generously. He would say, I wish my parents had been here for that. My father would have appreciated it and my mother would have uh, believed it. Um, so I'm glad uh, to be with you. I'm not gonna make my initial remarks too long because I will learn more from responding to what's on the minds of a distinguished group uh, like yours. But let me try to give you a sense of how you might see the world if you were living in Washington and New York and talking to people who were closely involved in American politics and American economics. Uh, each day. I think the first thing you would say is that the Biden administration is off to an extraordinarily positive uh, start. If you had said what last July, suppose that President Biden, Vice President Biden is elected as president, what do we think the odds are that the COVID rate will fall by 80% in his first 100 days, that he will achieve in his first 100 days 250 million vaccinations? What do we think the odds are that in his first 100 days, there will be a report that GDP growth in the first quarter was 6.5% that that was a substantial underestimate and that it was likely to accelerate into the second and third quarters. What do we think the odds of that, I think it would have been extremely unlikely. If we had said that the first 100 days of a new presidency would go by with no major incidents of mismanagement, no dramatic failure of an attempted uh, appointment, no gaffe by the president, no incident of substantial turbulence like that that Bill Clinton experienced over, gaze, uh, over the gays in the military uh, issue, we would have thought that that was really quite unlikely. If you had asked what were the prospects that there would be such a strong sense of reestablishment of rapport 
between the United States and its traditional allies. I would say that there were high expectations for a post-Trump world and uh, that those expectations have uh, been met. So I think it is important to begin any discussion of uh, the US outlook with a recognition of just how positive the last 100 days have been. And I think that extra kudos go to the presidential uh, leadership in the fact that with the narrowest of mandates, no majority without the vice president in the Senate, a majority of only three or four people in the House of Representatives, he has a legislative agenda put forward, assigned a serious prospect of substantial passage that invites comparisons with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So I think that those in the president's camp, the president himself, have every reason to take enormous satisfaction from what has happened over uh, the last uh, 110 days. And uh, there's no impression more important than a first impression. And he, Joe Biden reintroduced to America as its president has made an extraordinarily positive uh, first uh, impression. That said, I think it needs to be recognized, and this is where I'll devote more of my remarks, that there are, I believe, very substantial challenges ahead on the horizon, and that the remainder of this year may well not be as easy as uh, the first 110 uh, days uh, have been. And I will highlight as I uh, talk uh, four sets of issues. The macroeconomic uh, environment in, uh, the United, in the United States, the management of globalization uh, going, uh, going, going forward, uh, the question of uh, America's um, impact in the public investment program and uh, programs of increased generosity that uh, President Biden has put forward and the broader geopolitical uh, configura uh, configuration. The, macroeconom the macroeconomic uh, policy uh, environment, uh, as some of you will have seen, um, I am very con concerned that a valid Keynesian impulse has been taken to very substantial excess in uh, the United States. And I think the evidence is increasingly uh, clear that that is uh, the case. Core, the core consumer price index this month increased at a nine tenths of a percent rate that corresponds to an annual rate of 10%. It was of the core CPI increased more rapidly than the regular CPI. The inflation rate in the first quarter of this year was very substantially more rapid than the inflation rate in the last three quarters of uh, last year. That is only one of many indicia of concern. Reports of labor shortage are now pervasive in uh, 
the uh, United States, the vacancy rate is at record lows, suggesting very substantial tightness in labor markets. The quit rate is at record highs, suggesting that employees have a very great sense of optimism about uh, their capacity to find uh, subsequent uh, jobs. Measures of inflation expectations inferred from markets are significantly up. Measures of survey inflation expectations are up. Uh, small businesses are reporting more pressure for price increases than any time since the early 1980s. In one recent survey, 91% of the American people are either very worried or worried about uh, inflation. There is general poo-pooing of inflation concerns coming out of the administration and coming out of uh, the central bank. They are at great pains to stress their belief that inflation is transitory. Perhaps they will prove to be right. My own view is that with growth this year likely to approach seven or eight or even 9%, that labor markets will be tighter, that um, product markets uh, will face even uh, greater uh, demand, and that the housing market, where house prices rose 18% over the last year, but are measured in the price index as only having risen 2%, is uh, the increase in the price of homes will, at some stage, feed through into the rental measure that appears in uh, the price index. And so I am very concerned that inflation expectations will become unanchored and that the Fed will face profoundly difficult uh, choices about uh, either allowing inflation to further accelerate or taking steps to cool things off, which are very difficult to do in a way where things remain stable. So I think the first large challenge is going to be of macroeconomic uh, management, where I have, as I've expressed, very substantial concerns, given the magnitude of the stimulative policies that have been pursued. The second broad issue is um, the management of uh, globalization going forward. The United States has taken trade policy essentially off the table. It is very unlikely that there will be significant new initiatives to promote uh, commercial uh, integration. I believe that the philosophical change that Secretary Yellen has brought about from a approach to international taxation that is directed at winning a race towards the bottom, towards a uh, an approach that is based on containing the race towards the bottom and establishing a regime where it's not possible for mobile capital to largely escape taxation through transfer pricing techniques and through the its choice of location of headquarters. I believe that that is philosophically appropriate, though I recognize that there's an enormous amount of complexity and challenge uh, in uh, the details. I believe that the United States is facing what may well be in the international economic arena, the most serious set of challenges around technological leadership that it has faced um, in uh, a century. There 
was to be sure great concern that proved to be exaggerated about the United States falling behind after Sputnik in the late 1950s. There was great concern. It was widely uh, remarked that the Cold War was over and Germany and Japan had won in the early 1990s. And so I think it's appropriate to be cautious in judging the Chinese challenge, but the challenge of IT enabled authoritarian capitalism is I believe a enormous uh, challenge to the United States and uh, to the West. And we do not yet have a fully formulated uh, policy response. One of the crucial issues for the Biden administration on which less has been said than most other consequential issues is how we will regard our large technology companies. Will we regard them as national champions in a profound competition with China? Or will we regard them as grave threats to the tone of our national discourse, privacy, and uh, consumer uh, interests? And those issues are as yet uh, unresolved. Uh, a third set of issues um, comes out of um, what I think is an important feature of this uh, movement, this moment, and I think will probably have global implications. Political tides run in and they run out. There was a broad pro-government progressive tide that ran from the end of the Second World War through the late 1970s and has now run out for, was running out through the 80s, 90s and uh, the noughts. With the financial crisis, one started to see a broad reassessment of the role of government it is reinforced by the financial crisis, by rising inequality, by the challenge of uh, sustainability, and of course, by the challenge of uh, COVID, which will not be the last pandemic the world faces in my lifetime, and I'm 66. And how that is going to be managed um, is, an, uh, is a third, is a major challenge in uh, this moment. The president has proposed the most sweeping domestic legislative uh, program between the Families Act and the Job, Jobs Act on top of the stimulus already provided that I discussed uh, earlier. Will he be able to generate political support for it. If he does, will the measures work? Can industrial policy replace carbon taxation in generating uh, sustainability? How much needs to be spent and what is the right mix between public and private infrastructure? To what extent can a broad social safety net Bill that will support a middle class that is more trusting of each other and more trusting of government be built on a foundation that comes only from taxing those in the top 1% of the income distribution. These are profound challenges that are not yet answered, but will be answered in uh, the policy uh, responses. Finally, uh, the Biden administration um, is started, but only started on meeting the broad geopolitical challenges of uh, this uh, moment. Some come from the fact that 
fostering global cooperation on global public goods is probably now as important for security as balancing power. And I think particularly of climate, and I think particularly of uh, pandemic risk. Some come uh, perhaps most critically from uh, China. Um, China is making it, as I think you in Europe are discovering, um, China is making it harder to reject the concept of a new Cold War than it seemed a year or two ago. The combination of wolf warrior diplomacy, heavy-handed tactics towards uh, neighbors, uh, uncertainty about what the real story is involving uh, COVID, increasingly menacing uh, rhetoric with respect uh, to its uh, near uh, abroad and problematic economic uh, practices have um, made the crafting of a relationship with China um, a larger and more difficult challenge than it appeared um, a year or two ago. And I think it has to be recognized that for all the success, and I think it is enormous success that the new tone in US diplomacy has uh, had, um, our major adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, seem to be drawing closer to one another. And that has to raise concerns about whether the world is going to be as well ordered from our point of view over the next generation as it has been uh, over uh, the last. So I look forward taking great satisfaction from the really tremendous success that I believe the administration has had over the last few months with a clear-eyed view that there are enormous challenges ahead that will hopefully generate the kind of creativity and success that President Biden has enjoyed during his first few months in office. Thank you for very much for the opportunity to speak with you. And thank you so much, Larry, for that very wide ranging uh, introduction. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about there. Let me just kick off with picking up on that point about political tides that you mentioned uh, from the 30s to the 70s and from the 70s to at least the financial crisis. Is it possible that even though the intellectual climate or intellectual view has changed with regards to government, interve government intervention or free markets, that, that it may not make that much of a difference? And just as an example, since the 70s, it's very, very hard to find any country in the world where government spending as a percentage of GDP has declined by much. So rolling back of the state, you heard it talked about a lot, but doesn't show up in government spending and tax figures. Um, you, you could look at the Trump administration was very much against uh, hostile to globalization, yet the United States continued to globalize uh, trade and investment uh, both in and out of the US continued and increased during the Trump administration. So could I maybe suggest that while the ideas may be changing and there may be uh, greater support for government intervention that it may not turn out to be as long lasting a phenomenon or you know, is, is particularly what's happening in the US so big now that it really is a, a, an FDR type uh, moment? Dan, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, and I think you're right to sort of emphasize the relative importance of 
broad economic uh, forces relative to particular policy debates. I guess, and you're certainly right, that the size of the state has not been rolled back um, substantially uh, almost anywhere. I would make uh, these points though. I think the kinds of trends that existed as of the mid 1970s have very much not continued. And so there's a question as to what benchmark one uses. Does, does one use the trend or does one ask has the absolute size of the state been uh, scaled back? I think if one looks at top tax rates, for example, one does see rather more substantial change than you describe. If one looks at the extent of economic regulation, one sees some substantial scaling back. If one looks at the extent to which market forces are allowed to operate in uh, labor markets, one sees some substantial uh, scaling back. So I think that if I may have overestimated the force of uh, the post-1980 changes, I think respectfully the way you framed the, framed the question perhaps underestimates the strength of uh, those uh, forces. I think that you're right and um, that I think I am, I am surely right to be picking up the temper of the discourse in the United States, which involves a large number of comparisons to the great society and to the New Deal, uh, to uh, Franklin Roosevelt. I am reporting that accurately to my European friends. How much of it will take place? What will historians look back and see? I think that is a fair uh, comment. I think it is useful to look back and uh, look at the size relative to GDP of the programs of the New Deal or the programs of the Great Society. And I think you will find that they are rather smaller relative to GDP than they loom in historical imagination. And so if one looks at uh, the size of the Families Act, the Jobs Act, the Recovery Act, measured in dollars relative to GDP, they look pretty large relative to what Roosevelt was talking about or what Johnson was talking about. But you're absolutely right in its early days. And I was endeavoring to distinguish rather sharply in the way I structured my talk between the great success of the last four months and the substantial uncertainty uh, that lay ahead in part for exactly your reason, that I think it was um, way premature to coronate uh, Joe Biden as the next coming of Franklin Roosevelt. Let me come to one of the issues you raised about tightness in the US labor market, which from where we were a year ago seems, seems extraordinary that, that one, one could worry about tightness in the US labor market. Do, do you see that as something that will continue? And how do you see the, the, the sectors that have been most affected by uh, the pandemic, the hospitality, the transport, the airline sectors, will they all just bounce back within a few months or it, will there be a scarring effect and even with this unprecedented stimulus, do you think unemployment in the US will, will remain higher for longer or it'll drop straight back? I think the scarring look, I mean, in the US, and it is a tribute to policy, in the US, we are going to reach previous levels of GDP, we're more or less at previous uh, levels of GDP right now as we make our way through uh, the second quarter. 
we are going to reach previous levels of GDP adjusted for trend by the end of the year or before. So this idea of profound long-term scarring measured in terms of GDP looks much, much less frightening than people imagined it as being. To some extent, we are likely to see productivity increases of a kind that people didn't envision, though perhaps they should have, and perhaps they are in some deep sense uh, illusory. I live in a town just outside of, Mass of Boston, Brookline, Massachusetts. My guess is that before COVID, there were eight Indian restaurants in my town, it's a big town. Um, I would guess that this summer, there will be four or five Indian restaurants because three or four, three of them will have closed. The consequence of that will be on the one hand that I will have a little less choice, that when I wanna go out for an Indian dinner, I will have to drive for seven minutes rather than for four. But that about the same number of Indian dinners will be eaten, but fewer people will be employed in serving them because the demand will be consolidated in a smaller number of more congested restaurants. So I think that kind of thing is probably taking place in many, in many different spheres and is going to mean that GDP is going to be relatively robust. As you probably saw, Dan, um, employment as reported for April was less strong than people expected it to be. There is a great debate. I think the better reading of it is that it is not because there was not demand for labor. It is because of very, it is because a combination of the continuing impact of COVID and very generous unemployment benefits caused people not to want to come to work. So I think we are likely to have a, some somewhat extended period of relatively low employment levels, but that is not gonna reflect the lack of demand for labor as much as it's gonna reflect the lack of willing supply of labor. And from your observation of the European labor market, would you uh, view it in a similar way, or do you think the, the European labor market just doesn't work as well and we, we, the risk of longer term unemployment here on this side of the Atlantic is greater? I think that, um, I suspect that optimal macroeconomic policy in response to COVID would have been some happy medium between ours and yours. I think, as I think I've made clear, that we have rather overdone it on the demand side and quite possibly have created some real problems for ourselves down the road. I think the combination of European attitudes towards stimulus, which are more austerity enthusiastic on average, and the complexities of union um, the difficulty of individual countries doing stimulus and the difficulties of uh, common policy means that European policy has been less stimulative than I would have liked. And I think Europe is also somewhat behind on the vaccination uh, process. So I would not make nearly as strong a statement for, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to make as strong statements for Europe in general as I do for the United States because I feel much less confident of my knowledge. But on top of that, my best guesses would be that demand is much more constraining in Europe than it is in the United States. 
Right, let me do a couple of rapid fire on some of the questions that, that have come in. Um, policy response in the US, do you think it'll change the trajectory of earnings growth for the lower paid, famously stagnating uh, lower incomes in the US? I think, that, I think that we're likely to have pretty hot labor markets for a while, and that's likely to work to the benefit of the lower paid. I think that what's been done with the child credit, with the earned income tax credit, with the lump sum checks, I think all of this is probably meaningfully egalitarian um, in, uh, in its impact. So I don't think we can treat inequality as a solved problem, but I think there probably has been meaningful progress made particularly in what concerns me most, um, inequality in the circumstances of different children. Great, let me get another one on um, the administration's infrastructure plans. Uh, your view, big, too big, big enough, targeted enough? Probably uh, not quite big enough. Um, given the size of the public investment gap and probably with more too much attention to the quantity of public investment relative to the quality of public investment. I'd like to see more emphasis on involving the private sector, more emphasis on procuring as cheaply as possible, more emphasis on accelerating the uh, regulatory review processes uh, for a uh, project. And so to take just one example, I've always thought it was ironic that in socialist Europe, almost all the airports are privately owned and in capitalist America, almost all the airports are publicly owned. And I think that's a metaphor for a fairly broad range of issues involved with infrastructure. A question here from the Irish Times newspaper. Uh, your point about uh, is mobile capital escaping taxation. Uh, question, what effect do you think uh, this policy will have on Ireland where many US multinational corporations have set up European headquarters and also benefit from low corporation tax rate in Ireland? So do, do you think that the changed position of the US on corporation tax globally uh, will have an impact on American firms establishing either subsidiaries or changing uh, domicile completely? Um, uh, with particular, obviously this question is particularly concerned about Ireland, but if you have thoughts about Ireland, they'd be most welcome, but even more generally on a global basis. I think Ireland is an attractive location to live, an attractive location for expatriates, an attractive location to uh, produce, and particularly with um, Britain outside of the European Union, an attractive location for companies from other English speaking countries to access the, access the European continent. I think, I think Ireland should prosper on the basis of those strong structural advantages. I do think that Ireland has prospered, that there has been an, excess, a, an excessive attraction to location in Ireland coming from tax arbitrage. And it would be my hope and expectation that there will be negative pressure with respect to Ireland making itself attractive, not through its very substantial real advantages, but through its uh, ability to be a location uh, for uh, tax arbitrage. And I suspect that will pose certain challenges uh, for uh, Ireland. Uh, if one looks at, um, for example, the differences between Irish GNP statistics and Irish GDP statistics, 
they do, I think, suggest uh, some cause uh, for uh, concern. But I don't think, I don't, I don't believe that Ireland is unable to prosper on the basis of its very strong um, economic, its great economic strengths, rather than simply, rather than going some distance in the direction of uh, the Cayman Islands or other tax haven jurisdictions. There's a question here on, on the Fed and it may be banking too much on the transients of the, the consumer price inflation increase. Is that a risky position for the Fed to, 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 to be quite so strong in, in viewing uh, the blip in inflation as being merely a blip? And another question more widely on, on central banks and the use of central banks balance sheets. Do you, create, do you think this creates risks down the line or do you think it can be managed as maybe the Japanese have managed it over the past 20 years? I am uh, in a world where central banks pay interest on reserves. I am less, I'm less alarmed than, uh, than, mo than many about the growth of central bank balance sheets. Um, I think ultimately um, the question of um, how a country manages its debt between the balance sheet of the treasury and the balance sheet of the central bank is a little bit like the question of how my wife and I manage our finances. And from the rest of the world's point of view, it's um, what debts we take on as a couple um, or don't take on, what assets we invest or don't invest as a couple, and what is in my bank, what is in my bank account and what is in my wife's bank account is not the paramount issue. And I feel the same way about issues when central banks uh, buy uh, government debt, as long as they're paying interest on uh, their monetary uh, liabilities. I am, um, I am very concerned that uh, the Fed's um, analytical assessment that inflation is transitory combined with its policy move towards um, not being preemptive with respect to inflation will be to repeat the mistakes of the 1960s and uh, 1970s. I see every situation is different, but I see disturbing parallels in terms of the elevation of um, social objectives in monetary policy, in terms of the dismissal of significant inflation rates by pointing to transient factors in terms of the um, desire uh, to uh, justify relatively easy policies. And I'm in particular worried that um, we face a potentially unfortunate cycle in which rising, in, rising inflation rates mean declining real interest rates, mean looser and looser de facto monetary policy. And so not only are we not tightening with respect to inflation, but the consequence of inflation is to itself generate an easing of uh, monetary policy. Larry, uh, thank you so much for that. We've got enough questions that we could have gone on for uh, another 45 minutes just to answer or put the ones uh, that are here to you. But uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of uh, our, our public event here. So let me take this opportunity to uh, thank you once again for joining us and sharing uh, those, those perspectives and thoughts on such a wide ranging um, range of issues. Um,
and uh, we wish you a good, is it a good morning, still a good morning there? Uh, yes. Well, good rest of the day um, and look forward to welcoming you uh, back in person the next time. So thanks. Thank so you very much. Very nice to talk with you. Thank you.